Good day, good evening to all of you. Thank you very much for joining us for the launch of IFPRI's flagship publication, The Global Food Policy Report, which this year is on transforming food systems after COVID-19. The coronavirus pandemic has taken a terrible toll on human life and health, and it has also upended local, national, and global food systems and put the, put the sustainable development goals even further out of reach. IFPRI researchers and our partners have spent all of 2020 and continue to ascertain both the impacts of and policy responses to COVID-19. This strong evidence base then allows them to draw some crucial lessons from the world's response to the pandemic, which if heeded can help address future shocks and contribute to food system change. Throughout this program, we would like to hear from you to participate in our Q&A session, which will follow the presenter's remarks. Please make sure to submit your questions on ifpre.org, Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, or by using the hashtag AskIfpre on Twitter. It is now my very big pleasure to invite uh, Dr. Agnes Kalibata, uh, to launch our event today. She is, as all of you know, the UN Secretary General Special Envoy to the 2021 Food Systems Summit. Um, Agnes, we're very grateful for you to join us and we look forward to your remarks about also how COVID has shaped your thinking as the key architect of this year's uh, Food System Summit. Over to you, Agnes. Thank you, Sherrod, and, and uh, thank you for the welcome remarks uh, and uh, for the invitation. Uh, thank you to our IFPRI colleagues. Yeah, thank you to our IFPRI colleagues and the CGIR in general for, for organizing this meeting, which is extremely important uh, to the work that we are doing today. Uh, the, the question that is being addressed here, you know, uh, coming back or build, building back um, uh, post COVID is extremely important uh, given that COVID has definitely contributed significantly to eroding the gains we had made. Uh, we know that this was already uh, happening through climate change. So reversing years of progress, especially for some of us that, uh, that live in, uh, on the equator and, and, and in Africa here is something that we are seeing every day and COVID has definitely not, not made, it, made it easy. Poverty is increasing, as you all know. Uh, the, the most recent uh, World Bank report shows that uh, we just moved um, 73 from 73 million people to 120 million people in extreme poverty in a very short period of time uh, because of COVID-19. So there's no better time than now to really seize the opportunity, I must say, seize the moment to start doing something about our food systems to commit to strengthen our commitment and our ability to come through on 2030. The good news is our food systems, much as it's been part of the challenge, also offers some of the biggest opportunities. And the summit is exploiting that. When the summit was launched, when the food systems summit was launched, the secretary general recognized this. He definitely recognized that there's a lot of science and evidence that our food systems provides that opportunity for us to build back better and that opportunity for us to touch all the 17 SDGs that are very critical to this, the food system. So for me, this should report that we are launching today is a huge tool, is a huge instrument in unlocking action uh, with, uh, and evidence that can help us uh, move towards the right level of action. And let me just give you an example when I talk about evidence and action, uh, I have worked with IFPRI for some time and I'm one of those people that took every advantage and every opportunity of the, the work that IFPRI does. In my country, when I was in Rwanda, I, I used to use IFPRI reports. I would wait for that report to be able to design the evidence and really write it, <laughs> the evidence out of that report and use it to go to my, my uh, minister of finance and tell him where we needed to go. So for me, this report is extremely important as a global report that looks at the challenges that we are sitting amidst today, but also the opportunities that, that, that get associated with the right level of evidence being given to people that are looking for solutions. The summit through its dialogues does provide a, a, another set of opportunity for people to discuss this report and think through uh, the, the opportunities it is offering, having looked at the challenges that it is basing itself around and really be able to come up with, with solutions uh, that are very, very much uh, into their, their localities, into their 
regions into the, the areas that they live in. But also build on the action tracks that we have launched within the Food System Summit, which action tracks have already come up with lots of ideas, over 1,200 ideas now, and counting because we just opened up for a whole new set of ideas. And we look at this as a huge opportunity for all of us to think about the type of coalitions and partnerships that we need to build to be able to, uh, to design uh, the, uh, our uh, capabilities and the build to come, to come uh, through on the challenges of, of, of our food systems. So I want to, to, to go to the three messages, as three critical messages that I want to leave with you all as we talk about launching this report. Let's seize the opportunity that the Food System Summit does give us because the Food System Summit really looks at bringing in a huge amount of people. I mean, we are touching near everybody. It's an opportunity that is presented by the UN to mobilize everybody. Let's take that opportunity, but also let's not forget the interest that has been generated, again, with people trying to find solutions around COVID. So let's not lose the moment to build back better using this, this opportunity that is in our midst. Let's also take the opportunity that action trucks are offering, like I said, I said before, because they do provide a lot of ideas. Let's use the opportunity for science and policy to come together. Let's use the convergence to be able to define how policymakers determine investments that go into, into uh, improving food systems. This is our biggest opportunity. The opportunity where we get to provide the evidence for policymakers to use and the opportunity where science gets to show us direction. And, the, and, and that must be the place where we expect our policymakers to make no regret investments in order to come through for people, but also for our planet. Our planet. We need to, to see the multiple wins that the Food System Summit offers. We need to see the fact that if we use, we take the advantage that is coming from our combined ability to come together, the, the CGIR, the, the IFPRI report, and all the other things that are happening around this. The fact that one, just to give an example, that one good seed that is climate smart could change lives of people in terms of poverty, in terms of nutrition, in terms of food security, but also send a kid to school. The multiple opportunities that come through this type of tools that we give to governments are, are huge and critical and we must not lose the opportunity to, 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 to use them to shape where we are going. I would like to conclude on a note that, that really wants to encourage you to look at the Food System Summit as a catalyst. A catalyst because it's the opportunity we have to step back and think about what is at stake and think about our creative capabilities and how we can unlock those creative capabilities to, help, to be able to come through for the world. It's an opportunity, it's a catalyst and an opportunity for us to think about how we reach the rest of the world and how we mobilize people together at a point in time. It's an opportunity also because there are so many summits that are happening this year and these summits all touch the food system. And the opportunity is we can use each of these moments to be able to take the results and the work of this report further but also, of course, it's an opportunity for us to build back better. And I'll stop at, at that point and really thank you all for, for asking me to be part of launching this report, which I'm looking forward to. Thank you so much, Agnes, for your remarks. Uh, great that you're stressing the inclusiveness of the, uh, of the summit. And I really like the, the phrase you used of needing both evidence and action. Um, evidence is so crucial for then deriving the context specific policies uh, at the national level. So thank you very much. Um, we now turn to uh, Marco Ferroni, who is uh, the, uh, the chair of the system board of the CGIR. And Marco is an architect as well. Uh, while Agnes is uh, working hard on the UN Food System Summit, uh, Marco is uh, really one of the key architects behind the One CGIR, which, as many of you may know, is bringing together even more closely the CGIR centers, including IFPRI. And we're also delighted to have you with us uh, here today, Marco, um, for helping us put the report in the context of the One CGIR. So over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Charlotte. Um, 
Uh, and thank you for inviting me to offer an introductory perspective in the distinguished company of Agnes Kalibata as you present the uh, 2021 Global Food Policy Report to the world. COVID-19 was declared a pandemic just 13 months ago, and in that time we have seen notable, very notable policy responsiveness and innovation to bolster agri-food systems, protect livelihoods, and maintain as much as possible food security. But at the same time, as we all know, and as the report uh, makes clear, the pandemic exposed existing weaknesses in food systems and many forms of inequality that compounded its consequences. Uh, leaving the prospect for rapid recovery uncertain. CGIAR has responded immediately. Our COVID-19 hub, co-implemented by IFPRI, provided a one-stop shop for agricultural, nutrition, livestock, and social sector research to help mitigate some of the worst effects of the pandemic, uniting our unique capabilities in the face of an extraordinary global challenge. And now, under unusual circumstances that required adjustments to workflows and research along the way, and indeed in a very short time, IFPRI has produced an excellent, highly uh, relevant flagship report, the result of which is the set of insights, learnings, and policy rec recommendations now before us. And therefore, my first point of four points that I'd like to raise is simply to congratulate IFPRI, management, the authors, the production team, on this latest global food policy report, which replicates the rigor and insight for which the GFPR has so deservedly developed a reputation over the years. The report treats the pandemic as a wake up call. COVID-19 could be a harbinger of potentially greater future disruptions to food security and livelihoods linked to climate change, natural resource degradation and biodiversity loss. My second point is therefore that to prevent such scenarios, we need to invest in resilient and sustainable agri-food systems to cater agri-food systems that cater to people's needs without despoiling the planet. CGIAR's research and innovation strategy to 2030 is crystal clear about this. Its premise is transforming food, land, and water systems in a climate crisis. Piecemeal incremental change will not deliver on this goal. Sustainable, healthy diets for all, for example, or the decoupling of food production from excessive land and water use are challenges that technofixes cannot solve. Systems transformation requires coordinated bundles of innovation, technological, social, institutional, and so on, and cooperative solutions to affect change at scale in given impact areas. Systems transformation is therefore about understanding and dealing with complexity through harnessing science and technology, learning from analysis and data, interpreting ambiguity and potential conflicts and adjusting incentives. As we know at CGIAR, policy research is central to all of this because the greater the knowledge, the lesser the risk. But research alone does not create impact, innovation does. Let us keep this in mind as we define our new portfolio of initiatives. My third point is that systems transformation and the associated prospect for impact at scale are the reasons we designed and are now implementing one CGIAR. Our more fragmented pre-reform condition was not fit for purpose to address the confluence of challenges arising from intricately connected systems that need a coordinated response. One CGIAR with the three science groups now being established as part of our new integrated operational structure provides the institutional framework we need for our scientists and partners to come together. It transforms us into a modern global organization at the cutting edge of research and innovation for policy change, capacity building and food, land and water systems transformation. Colleagues, Fourthly and lastly, this year is historically important for the causes we serve. The UN Food Systems Summit will be the global motivating uh, and consensus building event under Agnes's leadership, as we have just heard, the event that the world needs at this juncture. The backdrop will be the lingering pandemic, but from our perspective also one CGIAR, which brings new energy and capabilities to the table as we reposition ourselves as the science and, and uh, innovation partner of choice in tackling key global challenges. The report under discussion today illustrates how much the pandemic has probably set us back on the sustainable development goals. 
but by calling upon policymakers to redouble their efforts in recommended ways, the report is also instrumental in outlining the way forward. Today's speakers will bring this to the fore. This is an important, timely, and extremely relevant report, and I am certain that we will now have an illuminating discussion. Thank you, Charlotte, and over to you. Thank you very much, Marco. Um, I think it's terrific to hear the, uh, the excitement about this year, both with regard to the coming UN Food System Summit and the work that's taking place on, on one CGIR. We have a lot of bad news coming out of COVID, but as all of you have stressed, this is also a great opportunity, I think, for us to renew our efforts to, to work on these two very important initiatives uh, that will play such a crucial role in transforming food systems. So many, many thanks both to you and, and Agnes for, for joining us today. It's now um, my great pleasure to introduce IFRI's Director General, Yo Swinnen, who will kick us off with an overview of the uh, key findings and, and recommendations of the, of the report. Over to you, Yo. Thank you very much, Charlotte, and thank you very much for Marco and for Agnes for giving a wonderful introduction. As Charlotte already mentioned, both uh, Marco and Agnes are providing great leadership to very important transformations and, and events that are taking place this year. Uh, it's really a star lineup, I think, today uh, before me and after me, because we have great presenters from IFPRI as well, presenting uh, specific pieces of the analysis. John will give a summary of the policy, uh, implications, and then we'll have uh, specific insights on this, uh, several themes, several regions. Let me just make a few points just in order, if I run out of time, that to have these made across, uh, that they come across. The first one is really about uh, the transformation of the global food system is urgent and very important, okay? We know that uh, we have learned that COVID-19 has caused many troubles, but uh, COVID-19 has also yielded a lot of lessons. It has showed that crises can be opportunities, that changes can be made, and it has induced a lot of innovation and creativity, both in business practices and public administration, but also in our thinking about issues, I think. And therefore, as Marco and Agnes have very clearly said, uh, 2021 is a very special year, and we should use those lessons from COVID to make a radical transformation of the food system possible. And that is uh, very much the message that is coming out of our global food uh, policy report. As you know, and I think both Marco and Agnes already identified it, I mean, at IFPRI, we really try to focus on collecting data, collecting evidence, uh, doing analysis. We have a, a large group of uh, tools and resources at our Institute. And so in the report, we have a number of these resources, which we are illustrating. There's references how you can access them for to be used for, for everybody, really. And this is just this slide is just one example of a, a set of tools that are uh, available and that we work on. We are also right now working on developing more tools, more indicators and data to su uh, support, among other things, the Food System Summit. We are actively involved in a number of areas in preparation of the Food Systems Summit, such as in the gender lever, in the finance lever, where we are co-leading, but also in several of the action tracks, and we are supporting analysis to the scientific committee. Next slide, please. On the, um, let me just give a little bit of background before we move to, to, to the, the results of the report or the policy insights, if you want. We know that the world is not on track to eliminate hunger and malnutrition. Uh, Agnes already referred to the fact that there is a uh, poverty is increasing. This are data from our colleagues at FAO showing that since five years, hunger is on the rise again, however you measure it, okay? And this is a very bad signal. On the right-hand side, you see, th this is, if you want, this is our food system flower. It is the five key elements that a food system transformation should try to achieve. And the point right now is we are not doing that. Next slide, please. We know that the reason why we have um, an increase in hunger is a number of reasons. Climate change is one factor, but also there's been significant reduction in economic growth in, in developing countries. And there's been a rapid growth of uh, conflicts and forcibly displaced people worldwide, which have an impact on, on acute hunger very much so. Next slide, please. It's not only that there are a lot of people who are hungry, a lot of people, uh, even more people, cannot afford a healthy diet. We know that there are roughly, according to estimates, this is uh, up to 3 billion people, which is a huge share of the, of the population of this planet. 
2 billion people uh, have micronutrition deficiencies and on child malnutrition, we see that they're stunting, wasting and increasing overweight at unacceptable levels. Next slide, please. The, at the same time, another area where we are, this food system is not uh, satisfactory has to do with the say, sustainability of the system. It is pressuring planetary boundaries in the use of land and water. And of course, climate change is reinforcing this. And so the interaction with climate change is, is bi-directional. Uh, the food system is suffering from climate change at the same time as it is contributing to climate change. And all these things need to resolve. Next slide, please. You know, the numbers I just showed and the evolution were there even before COVID-19. And so COVID-19 has really reinforced a number of, of the problems. Um, here are on the left hand side are estimates done by IFPRI research on the impact on global poverty. And so the estimates go up to more than 100 million um, more extreme poor people in the world. And on the right hand side, estimates show that essentially there is a shift from high quality food, fruits and vegetables, animal products to lesser quality foods as a consequence of both the disruption of supplies, but particularly because of falls in incomes. Next slide, please. The, uh, what we also find is that, and this is a message that comes out, is clear now, I think after a year of analysis, is that the impact of COVID is very heterogeneous. And so one of the heterogeneity has to do with the social classes. And we see that poor people are disproportionately affected for a number of reasons. I think these are mostly well known, has to do with what their assets are, which is physical labor, which is constrained incomes that a lot of, uh, they spend a lot of, a large share of their income on food. They have more disruptions in their private food value chains, but also in the public change related to social and nutrition programs and to access to health services. Next slide, please. Here are, so um, some of these arguments were based on conce uh, conceptual arguments or some uh, um, modeling. Here we have results from a survey work that we have done. This is from Addis Ababa in Ethiopia. And we see that indeed poor people are clearly suffering stronger income decline, suffering more from income declines, and they're suffering more from negative, negative nutrition effects in uh, this region. And this comes back in a number of uh, surveys and studies we have done by now. Next slide, please. The, an interesting uh, fact is that if we look at the impact on rural versus urban in terms of poverty effect, we see that the impact is quite similar. It's very strong everywhere. Um, but in, if anything, the impact on rural poverty seems to be somewhat less than the impact on urban poverty. And this has to do with the nature of the COVID effects. Next slide, please. For example, here we have uh, analysis that's done by uh, James Sturlow and his team of, of country modelers. And so what they find is if you look along the value chain that the, the food services, uh, which are typically uh, more concentrated in urban areas, they have a lot of urban poor people in formal sectors working there are hit more than agriculture and uh, farming interests. And that translates, but at the same time, there's more people, poor people living in rural areas. So that kind of reinforced each other. Next slide, please. We know that women and children are especially vulnerable. There is gender impacts of COVID-19 in terms of health effect, income effects, empowerment of women, and schooling effects, which has long-term effect, as we know, for the development and the position of women in society. In terms of the impact on children, we see significant increases in child mortality and wasting uh, coming out of our recent analysis. Next slide, please. There's also a significant difference, as I already hinted at, the, at the, so the value change effect along the value chains in terms of how they have been affected by COVID. And here we see that we know that COVID is really a combination of an economic uh, depression, recession, job loss, income loss, and supply chain disruptions. And so increasing evidence shows that it's really the income effect and the job loss effect, which are having a, a bigger effect on the food, the negative nutrition and uh, income and, and food security situation of people more than the supply chain disruption. So this is data from our survey work in Myanmar. Next slide. One of the reasons is that there's been a lot of innovation going on in supply chains, both by the, by the public sector and by the private sector. And even within the supply chains, we see heterogeneity, global versus local supply chains, labor versus capital intensive, large versus small, etc. And so the innovations that we see, I think are really encouraging. There we see um, new technologies, new uh, organizational systems being introduced that people had not expected 
to be possible in such a short period uh, of time that, was, uh, that they could do this. Next slide, please. So my last slide really comes back to the, the, the basic point I started off with. I think we are at a transformative moment in history. We should use the lessons from the crisis, from the COVID crisis to transform uh, our food systems. We see a lot of creativity and innovation in value chains, in food systems, but also in policy thinking and in our thinking of the world in general, I think, and this we should use also related to specific policies such as finance, digital solutions, social protection, et cetera. And particularly the combination of the lessons that we learned, the openness of our thinking, the creativeness that has stimulated, has been stimulated, and the global summits which are here in 2021, that should be create a specific opportunity for us to really make a change this year and, and beyond. And there is obviously a crucial role to play for everybody involved, both private, the public sector, and us as well. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Yo. Um, we're now turned to John McDermott, who is the director of the CGIR Research Program on Agriculture for Nutrition and Health, and also the co-coordinator of the CGIR COVID Hub. Um, John, thanks for uh, outlining some of the policy implications uh, of the research that IFRI has done. Uh, thank you. Yeah, so I'll go through um, kind of in a bit more systematic way what's actually in the report. Um, and um, we're really focused on 2020, and you'll find in the report a kind of timeline of the key events that happened then. But we also illustrate two key impact areas. Uh, one on the left, where you see the cumulative deaths from COVID-19 over time. Um, and this is going into now March 2021. And then for 2020, what, what changed in terms of GDP growth? And um, deaths are uh, still increasing in many important places in the world. There's a lot of optimism after the dramatic decreases in, in GDP in 2020 that because of vaccines and fiscal stimulus, et cetera, that there'll be a big turnaround in 2020, but of, of 2021. But of course, the big assumption there is that we're gonna get COVID under control. Uh, but the emergence of variants and some of the surges we're seeing in different parts of the world um, in cases is very concerning. Next slide. Um, now, in crises such as this, it seems almost that every country is for itself. Uh, there have been some exceptions. Um, one notable one is that in the food price crisis um, 10 years ago, uh, or more, slightly more, um, there was a lot of export bans and the disruptions to the trade of major cereals and a lot of the pain was self-inflicted and we saw that that wasn't repeated. So there, there was some good news in terms of cooperation. Um, but how did, we, how did countries cope? Because they were largely on their own. Um, and, and one of them was we looked at kind of four categories of their responses that you can see over time. And there was a lot of initial activity especially around lockdowns and public health measures and fiscal stimulus, and then that got steadied over time. Um, and uh, so you'll, you'll see in the report illustrations of that as well as comments from policymakers in different countries. Um, I think one of the key lessons from this is that political will is not enough. You need some good systems in place to make things work, and Danielle is going to talk more about policy systems and, and how to make them effective and sustainable. Next slide. Now, one of the things that I think COVID and, and Yo talked about the, the multiple disruptions is the critical interplay between health, food and economics. Um, and there was a lot of evidence of this interplay during the year, particularly early on during the lockdowns. And on the right, you'll see a graph uh, which shows the kind of decreases in GDP and also uh, agricultural GDP uh, depending on the, on the level of lockdown. And you'll see in some of the countries with severe lockdowns, there was a massive decrease in agricultural GDP during the lockdown period. Agriculture was a bit spared, uh, but uh, this is an important lesson and it's an evolving lesson. I don't think we're seeing anybody going down to the lockdown levels that they had before. Uh, next slide. Uh, now, there was a lot of regional variation as well as uh, variation of countries within regions. And we looked at the regional differences from kind of three perspectives. One is try to put it in the context of longer term 
food transformation objectives in the region? Then what were the impacts of COVID on that trajectory? And then what are the implications for future food system transformation? And you're gonna hear later on from colleagues from Africa, South Asia, and Latin America on the experiences in those regions. Next slide. Now, as Yo noted, um, we considered five food system transformation goals in the report. And this is kind of an adaptation of, this, of the Committee of World Food Security Food System Framework, which had health, sustainability, and inclusion as critical objectives of better diets. And we've added two uh, goals that became increasingly um, prominent during the year. One is around efficiency and kind of emphasizing the role of private food actors um, in innovation and change, which we've seen a lot of. And the second was around resilience and these dramatic supply demand disruptions, um, and then kind of what we can do about them the, and the evolving role of resilience. And we have thematic chapters on each of these five goals. So let me describe those now, next slide. So on nutrition, um, you can see, and, and Yo mentioned it, that before the pandemic, there were 3 billion people that couldn't afford the recommended healthy diets that the world was telling them they needed. That's gone up by about 10% during the pandemic. What are we saying in the report uh, about uh, what to do about this? Well, one is that this focus on diets to address all forms of malnutrition comes through clearly and that low and middle income countries need support and kind of analysis and support to how they're going to look at food-based dietary guidelines as they move forward. Um, for those left behind, we need to supplement. They're not gonna make it on their own. And the healthy diets are gonna be dri driven by demand changes and focus on consumers and food environments. Next slide. Um, we also have a chapter on sustainability and natural resources and environment. And obviously in a crisis, there's a lot of awareness of these issues, but the evidence and action lag behind. Um, there is an interplay between the kind of environmental changes and food system changes we've seen in disease emergence. Um, and we also recognize, and it's been said by others that climate and other environmental shocks are increasing in both frequency and consequences. So the, the two main responses are, how do we build evidence and capacity to integrate environmental sustainability into nature positive food systems? And this is gonna take multi-pronged approaches, governance, institutions, policies, and technologies. A lot of the bundling that you'll hear from different people uh, during the, the talks. Uh, next slide, please. Um, you're gonna hear from uh, Niha about inclusion and the work we've done there. Um, a main message coming out of COVID is how it's exacerbated inequalities uh, that we haven't taken care of in the past and reversed progress on many SDGs. And Yo mentioned about the complex rural urban dynamic that was going on. And there's been major investments made in social protection that Niha will tell you about it because that reflected the urgency of the need and also but those were most effective when we could adapt and scale existing programs. Hard to build something from scratch in a crisis. Uh, next slide. Um, and then you're gonna hear from Rob about the efficiency of, and food supply chains. Um, and disruptions were heterogeneous, as you've heard, uh, differed by food and food system. Transitioning systems, the ones that are dynamically changing, particularly in lower middle and middle income countries have the most challenges. Um, but there's been a lot of, of, of improvements. Um, and one of the interesting dynamics is around the um, interplay between um, public and private sectors, which I'll come back to. Uh, next slide. And then finally, emphasizing resilience. And resilience isn't a standalone topic. It needs to be integrated into the other five goals. And we looked at resilience from kind of five objectives. One is mitigating the frequency and severity of shocks, information systems to help anticipate shocks and plan responses and building capacity to absorb shocks. Uh, next slide, please. So what's next? What are some of the main lessons? Um, and uh, obviously this is an initial act 2020. It isn't the whole performance and there's still a long way to go. It's an evolving situation. 
Um, and uh, we need more systematic support for vulnerable groups. That's clear that what we're doing now is insufficient. Be prepared for multiple and more frequent shocks as we go along. Um, and there's, but there's been some real opportunities and innovations exposed uh, where private food system actors are really able to move if they're enabled. Um, and then looking beyond the kind of policy actions to policy effectiveness and sustainability is critical as we've seen some countries have done much better than others. Um, and then these cross-sectoral coordination issues between health economics and food are crucial and we have to work to break down sectoral silos. So let me leave it there and hand it back to you, Charlotte. Fantastic, thank you very much, John. You've done a great job of lining up uh, our next uh, set of speakers and giving an overview of the, the report. We're now gonna move into a set of uh, rapid fires um, and I'm going to introduce the speakers at the very outset, but they will then pass the baton uh, uh, to each other. And before I introduce them, let me remind you that uh, we look forward to uh, seeing your questions. Some of them are already coming in. You can send your questions uh, to ifpre.org, Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, or by using the hashtag AskIfpre on Twitter. So the rapid fires will go in the following order. Uh, first, we'll have Danielle Resnick. She's a senior research fellow and theme leader for governance at, at IFPRI, and she will be discussing uh, um, the chapter from policy responses to resilient policy systems. She'll be followed by Nia Kumar, who's a senior research fellow also uh, here with us at IFPRI, and she will speak about inclusive food systems. How, how can we move towards inclusive food systems, looking at pandemics, vulnerable groups and the role, the very important role of social protection. Rob Voss will speak uh, on supply chains. Um, he is the director of markets trade and the institutions division at IFPRI. Then we move into our three uh, regional overviews. Uh, Sam Benin is the deputy division Africa uh, director for our Africa regional office. And we'll focus on uh, lessons learned in Africa. Rashid, Shahid uh, Rashid will speak uh, on the perspective from South Asia. And then Valeria Pinero is going to speak um, on Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, let me add uh, that, that, that Shahid is the director for South Asia at IFPRI and Valeria is a senior research coordinator. So with that, uh, I turn it uh, right away to Danielle and uh, thank you for kicking us off with this set of rapid fires. Okay, thanks so much, Charlotte, really appreciate it. So I'm gonna speak briefly about chapter two from the GFPR, which was written with John McDermott, as well as Nicola Naylor from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And one facet that we focus on in this chapter is how COVID-19 has really revealed the importance of building resilient policy systems in order to respond effectively and equitably in a crisis. So I'm gonna talk about four pillars that we see as really critical for building this uh, system resilience. The first pillar is adaptability. This is the opposite of rigidity and it essentially refers to the ability to modify existing policies relatively quickly when crises emerge and not just revert to the status quo. We found some countries were much quicker to find innovative ways to keep markets working or to expand new approaches to health testing and tracking. In Ghana, for example, using drone technology in remote rural areas to uh, deliver PPE and to engage in, in COVID-19 testing. Sri Lanka, for example, was able to move its centuries-old weekly tea auction onto an online platform relatively quickly. And in these and other cases, what really facilitated adaptability was the fact that enabling environments for business were already established. There was a willingness to work with the private sector and there was not just ICT infrastructure, but actually technology governance, including existing regulations to respect privacy and against misuse of data sharing, as well as inequity, addressing inequities in access. Uh, we also found having credible partners and a nimble bureaucracy were really key for adaptability. Next slide, please. The second pillar is coordination and coherence to mitigate volatility, confusion, and inefficiencies in policy responses. Uh, many governments focused initially on horizontal coordination, setting up multi-sectoral task force, um, and these tended to be most effective where you had clear and committed leaders that had clear and consistent messaging about the pandemic. 
We found vertical coordination tended to be the most problematic during the pandemic. Um, and this was because in many countries, both OECD and LDP, Lower, lower developed countries, less developed countries, we see that health has been one of the main mandates that has been decentralized over the last 20 years or so. And so there was a lot of uh, concurrent responsibilities across level of government creating confusion. This tended to be most pronounced in federal countries, um, such as in Brazil, where we saw governors and mayors even adopting more stringent mass mandates, lockdowns and testings than even the federal president thought was necessary. In places like Brazil, Nigeria, the United States, India and other federal settings, uh, this challenge of vertical coordination tended to be exacerbated where it was also compounded by political polarization. Next slide, please. The third pillar we look at is implementation capacity, which relies on two dimensions. The first is administrative capacity. And this really refers to having sufficient human and financial resources, skills, having oversight and accountability mechanisms and autonomous public institutions. We saw that variations in administrative capacity were not just relevant for health related responses, but also for social protection ones. And where these capacities were lower, we saw cases of corruption, hoarding, uh, poor targeting, poor accessibility of cash and food relief transfers. One example was in Nigeria where poor distribution of food relief led to raiding of food aid warehouses, underscoring citizen discontent. The other dimension of implementation capacity is enforcement. This requires a monopoly of force to protect borders, maintain order, and was essential for enforcing lockdowns, social distancing, and mass mandates. Next slide, please. The final pillar that we look at is citizen trust. And I think the pandemic has really vividly illustrated the importance of trust and highlighting that it doesn't just emerge in a vacuum. It often reflects longstanding state societal relations shaped by among other things, past experiences with government service delivery and inclusion. And we're seeing how relevant this is as we move into the current phase of the pandemic, as we're dealing with now vaccination campaigns, as current surveys in West Africa suggest low trust in government can have negative implications for citizens' decisions to get vaccinated. So in sum, we know we all want to enhance resilience, but thinking particularly about how we do this for policy systems and not just for discrete policy outcomes could be an especially fruitful area of inquiry as we try to be more proactive and anticipatory of future crises. So I'm now gonna hand off to my colleague, Neha Kumar. Thanks, Danielle. Um, in our chapter, we talk about how the COVID-19 pandemic disproportionately affected the most vulnerable people. These are people living in suboptimal conditions, dependent on unreliable livelihoods with limited to no access to healthcare. These are poor households in rural and urban areas, informal workers, migrant workers, women and children. In addition to the fact that they were disproportionately affected, the coping strategies will have long-term consequences. Next slide, please. We also highlight that the impacts were widespread yet uneven. For example, um, experience among rural and urban dwellers across the developing world were very different. Rural households were better insulated in the short run, whereas urban households were more affected. Even the food supply chain disruptions affected urban dwellers more, leading to um, which affected their nutrition security. And at the same time, coverage of safety nets was limited, very limited in urban areas. Informal sector workers, uh, such as workers in small factories, um, were were affected by by the by the lockdowns the most. These sectors are unregulated, um, and they were. They have low access to any kind of benefits or, and they fall through the cracks of social safety nets as well. Women and children were affected worldwide during the pandemic. Um, as male migrants returned home, women lost autonomy in decision making. And as we have seen in previous crises, women's assets are the first to be sold, pushing them further in, in the poverty um, uh, structure. Um, and then should, in, in, in addition to that, um, quarantine conditions ex potentially exposed women and children to greater violence at home with limited access to services that were, um, you know, in an overburdened healthcare system. Children were affected in mul multiple ways. So as I just mentioned, ex potential exposure to violence, but also uh, poorer nutrition, health, uh, 
uh, lack in schooling, and all of these contributing to uh, multiple development issues. But we also witnessed an unprecedented social protection response in the pandemic. Next slide, please. So there were 1,414 social protection measures taken by 215 countries and territories, which reached over a billion people. This compared to pre-pandemic levels, the benefit amounts doubled and the coverage increased by 240%. Yet there were many problems. Um, there were issues with the level of transfers, the amount and the duration. Um, the coverage was low and less than 2% of these measures were actually gender sensitive. But at the same time, they have important lessons for social protection programs going forward. As John mentioned, where the structures were in place, it was easy to go get the, get the, hit the ground running. But there were also many innovations. For example, 11 countries in Africa made adjustments uh, so that urban dwellers could receive transfers and public works were changed. I can give many examples which emphasize that there's no silver bullet for solving these diverse and multifaceted problems, but the local context, local and context specific innovations will provide the way forward. Next slide, please. The pandemic highlighted the importance of basic needs, safe and clean environment to live in, clean water, stable livelihoods, access to safe and healthy food, access to healthcare, safety nets. It is clear that the efforts in the past were inadequate and that a more systematic approach is needed. Um, and we know from the government responses that we observe that they are great testament, testament to uh, the where there's a will, there's a way. So all we need is, is better, more deliberate and intentional efforts with, which need uh, which are coordinated across sectors. I will now turn to my colleague, Rob Voss, who will talk about uh, food supply chains. Um, thank you, Nia. And um, indeed, I'll talk about uh, supply disruptions. And uh, as it was already mentioned by both Jo and John, uh, different types of uh, food supply chains have been uh, effective differently. At the risk of um, overgeneralization, but broadly, what we find in, in our research is that traditional supply chains have uh, been less affected, uh, relatively speaking, because they use less hired labor, they use their own family labor, so less affected by labor constraints and operate in shorter supply chains. Uh, in transitioning uh, supply chains, which are sort of transitioning from the traditional to modern supply chains, which are already longer, um, but where um, there may be still be a lot of um, uh, weaknesses in the uh, different connections between the various segments of the market, uh, like lack of good uh, transportation, um, storage space, and so on. Um, and where also um, firms and farms use a lot more hired labor, those have been much more um, affected by the labor constraints of labor mobility, disruptions in transport and uh, uh, weaknesses in other supply chain uh, uh, segments. And that has led to a lot more food losses. In contrast, uh, modern firms and modern supply chains um, have shown much more resilience, but particularly capacity to adapt and uh, innovate. And not just by providing protective gear to workers as shown in one of the pictures here, but particularly also uh, changing their operations and using additional services. Go to the next slide. Uh, we've seen quite a bit of um, acceleration in such innovations um, in how the supply chains uh, operate. The chapter we particularly focus on the retail business, but similar changes taking place in processing, logistics, uh, and other parts. So um, particularly uh, the use of digital technology have been leveraged and uh, what we've seen is various trends that uh, have accelerated. Uh, first, uh, we see e-commerce firms that are nothing to do before with the food business entering food value chains. Uh, so for instance, an e-commerce um, firm like a Big Basket in India um, has uh, teamed up with um, Uber India and Rapido, a bike delivery firm to enter into the food delivery uh, market in, in India. 
Conversely, also food retailers and processors have been increasingly using e-commerce uh, for home delivery or to in better integrate their own supply chain. So like Walmart, India, large uh, uh, supermarket uh, chain um, um, acquired uh, Flipkart, which was a, a more general e-commerce firm in order to um, uh, boost, give a boost to their online uh, grocery delivery. But they also um, acquired um, or invested in Shadowfax, a, a startup in logistics, to connect uh, their value chains, their supply chains to um, small and medium enterprise providers uh, and local markets uh, for supplying uh, to their um, grocery stores and particularly also the online delivery. Um, so. We see all these uh, changes, they're not entirely new, but it has accelerated dramatically during COVID-19. If you move to the last slide, um, it, what does it mean? Well, here's the, just to show all the, the change in the supply chain towards much more use of, uh, of E, what we call E or electronic uh, platforms for SE intermediation logistics um, to connect different segments of the market chain. Go to the last slide. Um, what does it mean for policies? Um, first, um, uh, there's a lot of opportunities out there. And from the examples I've given, see a lot more new dynamics that's creating new job and income opportunities for workers, uh, particularly also small and medium scale enterprises to uh, link up to these uh, modernizing supply chains. But this will not come automatically. So the policy challenges um, are three, as we um, highlight those in the, um, in the report. The first is um, for governments uh, to recognize this market dynamics and not to think that they can control it or even generate such dynamics, but rather to recognize it and try and steer it and facilitate these processes, particularly um, in infrastructure, um, whereas there's needs for improved transportation, training, but particularly also the infrastructure for uh, bridging the digital uh, divide. And lastly, um, uh, nothing will work uh, automatically well also with new entrants in the markets, uh, e-commerce firms that uh, uh, come from outside of the food business. So the importance of uh, good controls of food safety, food standards, becomes increasingly important in order to um, allow for both uh, better outcomes in terms of uh, um, nutrition and food safety, but also uh, to allow um, uh, small market players to stay in business and be able to um, functioning uh, efficiently in those market, uh, uh, changed market circumstances. With that, I'll move it over to Sam, my colleague, Sam Benin. Thanks, Rob. Compared to other world regions, Africa has escaped the awful health impacts of COVID-19. This is due largely to the continent's sizable younger population, but other factors, including the warmer climate and behavioral differences, such as being outdoors for prolonged periods of the day have also contributed. But the lockdowns to mitigate the spread of the virus and the global slowdown have had substantial impacts on growth, value chains, income, trade, poverty, and consumption. For Africa as a whole, the contract contraction in GDP in 2020, for example, is estimated at between 1.7%, assuming a mild spread of the disease and lockdowns ending in the first half of 2020, to as high as 5.1% under a severe virus spread scenario with extended lockdown periods. If we look at the lockdown periods only, the bottom figure that you see in the chart shows GDP contraction for selected countries in the range of 14% in Ethiopia to about 38% in Rwanda, and also poverty increases of 9% in Ethiopia and Ghana to 15% in Senegal. Beyond the lockdowns, governments 
across Africa adopted various fiscal, monetary, and balance of payment policies to mitigate the socioeconomic impacts of the pandemic and the health-related re restrictions. The cost of these policies in terms of higher government expenditures or the foregone revenue is estimated at about $38.5 billion or 2.4% of GDP. Given that governments, many governments across Africa spent 25% of GDP as expenditures, you can see that this is a huge, huge amount. Most notable among the policy responses is social protection, whose coverage on average nearly quadrupled from 3% before the pandemic to 11% during it. For many countries though, this cost is high and presents risk of future fiscal crisis. For example, Ethiopia, Ghana, and Senegal, among the countries that are featured in the, in the analysis. Given the region's vulnerability as reflected by the not too distant Ebola outbreak and the recent fall army worm and locust infestations, for example, ensuring that Africa's countries are prepared to anticipate and withstand future shocks will be critical to the transformation of Africa's food systems. This will require taking a food systems approach to policy implementation and planning that is based on evidence from Africa's own situation and dynamics with respect to long-term issues such as climate, biodiversity, demography, urbanization, value chains, and trade. Given that more frequent shocks and consequent emergency responses demand more of the already tight public budget, then increasing the efficiency of public spending will be critical. So investment should be ramped up in key areas for long-term growth and productivity, such as infrastructure, early warning and monitoring and evaluation systems, agricultural research and extension, and education and health. These investments will also help mitigate the impacts of shocks and facilitate more effective and efficient responses to the shocks. Thank you. And I hand it over to Shahid for the analysis on the South Asia region. Thank you, Sam, and greetings to everyone, wherever in the globe you are joining us from today. <clears throat> so I'll be presenting uh, insights from the South Asia chapter. And I have framed my presentation with two questions. <clears throat> These questions are, of course, a global relevance, but I'll try to answer them with South Asian perspective. So the question number one is, can there be an economic transformation without the transformation in food system? The answer to that question, I think a resounding yes. In fact, that's exactly what we pointed out during the last year's global food policy report on South Asia. What we pointed out there is simple thing. South Asia was the fastest growing sub-region since 2014 until the onset of pandemic. The signs of economic transformation were obvious. Agriculture share was declining, real wages were going up, and non-farm sector jobs were going up. These are classical signs of economic transformation, but food system lagged behind. Food system transformation, all this structural change did not have significant impact on the food system transformation. So the point is then, if that is possible, what, what does that mean for today's context? I'll come back to that, but let me look at the second question now. Can there be a food system transformation without economic and a structural transformation? The answer to that question, I think probably no because food system is a subset of economic system. So unless we have economic system transformation, we cannot achieve food system transformation. And this is, has been obvious in a number of cases. And that has been also the point has been made throughout the launching event today 
that there can be progress, economic progress, that can leave the poor and vulnerable behind. And that happened in case of food system, that happened in case of job loss, and that is perhaps the reason why our profession has been emphasizing so much on inclusive transformation, be it inclusive agricultural transformation, inclusive growth, all of those terms are coming to the fore. Okay, now the question is why do we need economic transformation for food system transformation? Answer is very simple, because unless we have economic transformation, we are not going to have the resources to make investment on the core pillars of the food system transformation. Is that important? Now I have two more slides. Can you go to the next slide, please? So I have two more slides. One, uh, this is a bunch of pictures, but the key point from this picture is this, is that we cannot we must not lose sight of all challenges. What are the old challenges? So South Asia grew faster than the institution that are needed and investment that are needed for food system transformation. So the food system transformation lagged behind as some of those challenges are still there. So the picture I have at the bottom corner, that is a bird flu picture. It, that happened during the pandemic. So food safety issue, regulation issue are still there. Picture above that is the flood that Bangladesh experienced during the pandemic, not only flood, but also a cycle. And the third picture I have is the fall army war, which savaged Pakistan, Afghanistan, part of India and Nepal. And that was also a big issue in Africa. The last picture I have in this, this is the question of a structural policy issues. This has been, this is nothing new. It caught the capture, the attention of the world and popular media during the farmers protest in India. Without taking any side, one can think that this is, this is a serious problem. Unless these issues are tackled, food system transformation will be difficult in the future. Given the incentive structure that policy has created, unless those are dismantled, the food system cannot transform in the future after the COVID. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is my last slide. So two pictures here. This is in the context of my second question. Second question is that we need economic transformation to have food system transformation. So now look at this. I'll start the first, the first one uh, picture. This is also a very popular image. We all saw that during the beginning of pandemic when lockdown caused migrant workers walk hundreds of miles to get back home. What does that mean in the context of the structural transformation or economic system transformation? As a student of development economics, what we know is that a structural transformation requires people moving away from agriculture, creating jobs in other sectors. And South Asia's transformation experiences over almost a decade has been that it was happening. In the last year's uh, global food policy report, we highlighted that the real wages were growing up, non-farm employment, in agriculture was exceeding farm employment. So those are clear signs of structural transformation. But what happened? Pandemic has reminded us that that is vulnerable, that is fragile. So the transformation, economic transformation that we are thinking about can be really vulnerable to shocks like this. The next picture is a very recent new picture. It's a symbolizing how health system got overwhelmed. So, so the, all the picture is very new. The message in it is the old one because our profession has long known that poor and vulnerable, if breadwinner gets sick, a family can slip into poverty. And that happens 
every single day in developing countries. We also have known for years that children dropping out of school or malnutrition in the early childhood reduces lifetime earning, degrades human capital, and people, rural vulnerable people, escape the possibility, escape the opportunity to escape the poverty. As a result, it becomes intergenerational. Now, so why are we making this point? The main point I'd like to make here is that when you talk about transforming food system after COVID, we must not lose sight of the structural challenges. My last slide, but I'll conclude in just one minute, is that what do we have, um, what do we take, take away messages from the South Asia? So two messages. One is that this is an opportunity. The last previous slide has demonstrated that COVID has manifested challenges at the same time drawn the global attention to structural problems like the health system, like the education system, like the rural employment. Now, we have to take advantage of that opportunity. That is the continuous theme of today's presentation. Now, I'd like to end with my last point. That is a remark for the South Asian political leadership. And that point is also in the theme of the global development agenda. And that point is the key sustainable development goals cannot be achieved unless South Asia achieved them. This has been a challenge. So the South Asian leadership has the moral responsibility to prove once again that it is a resilient nation and they can prove it one more time. My last point is that as a development professional, it is also our moral responsibility to be committed in making those changes, a theme that came through throughout this launching event. Thank you very much. Over to Valeria. Hi, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. I will present the Latin American and the Caribbean uh, perspective. Um, and uh, I, this chapter was done also with Eugenio Diaz Bonilla. So I would like to start this with just pointing out that the region, it is home of almost 8% of um, global population and about 30% of all COVID-19 uh, deaths. So some characteristics of the region that may explain why it has been particularly vulnerable to the pandemic could be that 80% of the population living in uh, urban areas. Um, Roughly half of employment is in informal activities. The rates of overweight and obesity are among the highest in the world. And last, the health systems have suffered because of the region's economic stagnation in recent years. So the governments have reacted with diverse policies uh, to the pandemic, from strong lockdowns in countries such as Argentina, Chile, and Peru, to allowing economic activities to continue lar largely and interrupted in cases like in Brazil and Mexico. To stimulus packages, Brazil, Peru, and Chile have spent well over 5% of GDP through fiscal measures, plus similarly large injections of liquidity. While Mexico and Uruguay have spent the equivalent of 1% or less of GDP, and then the other countries are all between these two groups. Despite these and other measures taken, the region's GDP declined about 8% in 2020. Next slide, please. And then I would like to highlight the importance of Latin America. Latin America is the world's leading net food exporting region and has a critical role to play in both global food security and in environmental sustainability and biodiversity. So the region's management of the current pandemic and its aftermath will have planetary repercussions globally. So next slide, please. So post-pandemic, the region will need to expand support for long-term transformation of the uh, food systems and redesign safety nets to address both the lingering impacts of the crisis and the vulnerabilities that underlie these impacts. However, 
we're not there yet. The COVID-19 pandemic has magnified structural gaps in inequality, limited fiscal space, low productivity, informality, and fragmented social protection and health systems. Moreover, the pandemic led to an almost 11 increase in the unemployment, a 54% increase in informal labor, and the closure of almost 3 million small and medium enterprises. So with this, the region will need to have a centralized and coordinated mechanism for testing, vaccination, and treatment. We'll also need to have a more granular monitoring of possible breakdowns in the agri-food chain. Um, it will need to redesign of social safety nets. We also need to monitor the liquidity conditions of SMEs and their credit situations to avoid bankruptcies and reinforce food safety in an R&D investment for not only productivity and climate change issues, but also to give resilience to food systems against future pandemics. Um, so I would like to finish this. We just um, pointed out two things that also they were presented by my previous colleagues. But one way that these issues could be overcome or these barriers could be, it could be the use of digital uh, digitalization of procedures at customs and other smart technologies, the artificial intelligence and blockchain, alongside incentivizing the logistics role played by e-commerce and delivery companies. And of course, that also to promote regional integration and corporations, so that these could be things that the governments in Latin America and the Caribbean could be thinking about, not only for dealing with the current crisis that we're still going through, but also to be able to avoid or to have a better mitigation strategies later on for future crisis. Thank you very much. Thank you so much to this uh, panel of stellar speakers. Um, very good overview of some of the key topics raised in the report and uh, overview of the regional developments. Um, we've got 20 minutes left for Q&A, so I'm going to ask them very quickly and uh, hope for brief responses from all of you so that we can get through many of them. Many thanks to all of the people from all over the world that are sending us questions. We're gonna kick off with some questions on the regional developments. Um, the first one is for you, Sam. Um, this comes from uh, Kiran Kukate from India. What happens to smallholder farmers amidst this pandemic? Um, are they getting remunerative prices for their farm produce? And if not, how can we assure that they do? Um, so I, I guess it would depend on which region, um, especially because Africa. different regions Let's make it for Africa since we're addressing it to you. Yeah, I'm talking yeah. about Africa. That's what I mean. Okay. So the Africa and the regions in, in Africa. Of because the, the pandemic and it's also the lockdowns, um, especially the lockdowns occurred at different times depending on which region you are. So for example, if you're in Southern Africa, it, the, especially the lockdowns were after the um, agricultural season. And so there you can see that it may coincide with the harvest and and, and others. In the West Africa and Eastern Africa, for example, it did coincide with the beginning of the season during planting, etc. So it would depend at the time of the, of the harvest and the sale and things like that. So typically, probably the regions, West Africa, East Africa, may be hardest hit in terms of getting the inputs for farming, whereas Southern Africa will be, will be hit in terms of selling their market output. So th those will be those will be it. But generally, um, um, some of the disruptions in like the markets because um, some of the markets were closed down would have an impact on on prices. Yeah. Uh, th thanks, Sam. Also for reminding me that Africa is many regions in in mm -hmm. one region. Um, um, Shahid, a question for you from an anonymous questioner: uh, Do you think that we're overestimating the impact of COVID on output? Uh, the 1918 pandemic killed 10% of India's agricultural labor force, and yet there was no decline in production. And unless I'm mistaken, I think the same is actually true today. Uh, India's agricultural output has not suffered. Yes, absolutely. Uh, so good question. I mean, if we, in the chapter, this is the point we have uh, pointed out. Uh, the region has done remarkably well the food system and agriculture system in South Asia has shown remarkable resilience. Why do I say that? Prices remain stable and agriculture sector grew everywhere. 
And India's growth in agriculture sector, 3.5%, was actually higher than the previous years. And at the same time, we are not overestimating the impact part of it. We are actually, the region has, uh, South Asia has reason to celebrate. Some programs work remarkably well. For example, ESSAS program in Pakistan, uh, Pradhan Mantri Gareeb Kulani Ajana in India, Food Friendly program in Bangladesh. So the rapid scaling up of the program was, uh, that is what made it possible for agriculture to grow and food market to remain stable. So we are not overestimating. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, Valeria, this question comes from Dr. Nokutala Vilakazi. The informal sector plays a huge role in urban food systems. The sector was unfortunately the hardest hit uh, with a pandemic. How do we ensure that the sector is more sustainable and more resilient to future threats? So again, I think that um, um, that in Latin America, it is the same thing that it was said um, in terms of Africa, in the sense that it's very heterogeneous as well. So in some countries like Peru, for example, the informal sector is even bigger than in other, in other countries. So again, the policies that we we'll need to, to be looking at, it will depend on the country we're talking about. But in terms of the informality, um, it is a very complex and complicated question to, to answer and how to avoid and work uh, forward that. But one thing that we need to, that it was highlighted with this uh, crisis is that it is needed also to take care of them in terms of the cash transfers and things like that. So I think that part of the, the idea is to be able to uh, register them in the, sense, in the data set and keep track of uh, the informal labor. So that's one of the, of the key things that it can be done and that there were differences in how it was dealt with the crisis in terms of uh, how to um, include the informal sector or um, it was done in countries that they already have some good uh, cash transfers programs um, in there. Thank you. Thanks, Valeria. I have uh, two questions that I, uh, I think should be directed at Niha. Um, they both pertain actually to gender. Um, the first one, anonymous questioner again, um, asks, how can we appropriately account for and incorporate the disproportionate impact uh, in terms of not just gender, but also urban rural of COVID-19 into global food policy? Um, and then the second question, Nia, is, comes from Michelle Ramirez from the National Institute of Public Health in Mexico. How do we ensure that rural women, women do not suffer discrimination in health services? How can we make sure health services are inclusive and culturally acceptable? Great. Um, so I, I'll answer the first question first. Um, I, I think to, we just need to pay attention. So to address a problem, we first need to identify it. So I think that's important. We need to identify the issues, understand them, and develop um, into innovations or interventions that are perfect for that context. And, and it's not like that we have to start from scratch. There are many examples out there. We, we uh, probably have some in, in, in the report as well. And before we go global, I think we need to go local. So we need to kind of address the problems at the local level, at the national levels. And then probably, uh, you know, I, I think it's a very, context specific uh, problem which needs to be addressed uh, at the local level. How can rural services be provided in an equitable way? Well, I think many countries are moving towards that. Um, they have health workers who are women. We've seen from the agriculture extension work, work uh, research that most ag extension workers are men and therefore the access to women for agriculture extensions extension is, is low. So whereas in, in the health sector, you know, there are more and more health workers are women, they're easy to approach. Um, also in India, for example, women's, so women's self-help groups, which are, you know, they're kind of local uh, grassroots level groups, which are being leveraged as, uh, as a way to deliver services. Um, so I, you wanted me to keep it short, so I'm keeping it short. Thank you, uh, Nia. Um, Rob, two questions uh, for you pertaining to markets. The first one comes from Victor Arwich in Kenya. 
How prepared are we to deal with farmers in the post-COVID era, bearing in mind that the farm inputs coming into Kenya are imported and the cost has uh, really increased? So a question about the price of inputs during, during the crisis. And then the second question, well, let's have you answer that one first. I'll come back to the second one. Yeah, well, I, I guess we were uh, not very well prepared in, in general to begin with, right? And particularly, uh, countries dependent on food imports or food um, inputs, imports, uh, they've been most heavily affected by the crisis in part because uh, uh, many African countries, for instance, they suffered uh, enormous uh, export income losses and that has restrained um, their import capacity as well as that it puts um, a downward pressure on their currencies to depreciate making the cost of imports more expensive, right? So. Um, if the countries reliant on those kinds of imports, they suffered uh, quite heavily, even if their uh, production sector was not directly impacted. But uh, the, the parts of the production sectors that were reliant on those imported uh, inputs, they were suffering um, from that. Um, so uh, that's also why there's many calls still out there, uh, still to be addressed in, in a large extent for also more international financial support to countries to resolve these macroeconomic constraints uh, that hit their economies at large, but particularly also the agriculture sector and consumers where the, the reliance is on imports. Great, the, the second question for you, Rob, comes from Masuna Ahili. Um, what's the framework for building food policies that promote food production locally? And maybe you can add to that, uh, how do we, address trading uh, regimes in, in the post-COVID era? Are there things that we need to be paying special attention to? Um, <clears throat> matter of fact, it's a bit more of a complex issue how to address this. Um, it's not generally true that more local systems become more resi uh, resilient to, to these kinds of crises. So sometimes if there's uh, much of food shortages, uh, then uh, being able to import food and use trade can be an advantage. Um, but as I said, it can also be a disadvantage uh, if, um, if you don't have the means uh, to take care of those, um, those imports. Um, it's, um, it's also in practice, we've seen supply chains being affected in different ways. So we've seen trade restrictions being enacted by a number of major staple food exporters uh, like for, for wheat and for rice. Um, and when that happened uh, early on in, into COVID, that, um, that gave uh, negative impacts on food prices uh, in those particular markets. So we've seen relative price stability in global markets, but not for wheat and rice during uh, April and June when these kind of uh, uh, trade bans were uh, enacted upon. But in other cases, some protection to local markets can give new opportunities for certain types of producers if they are, happen to be protected by um, those trade restrictions. So there's no general point there, but uh, in most cases, if you wanted to better develop your domestic food systems and uh, trade policy in terms of restrictions is not necessarily the best um, way to go about it because it may, can uh, equally erode your um, the resilience of your system uh, by having getting shortages uh, whenever there are shocks to your uh, local systems. Excellent. Thanks, Rob. A, a question for Danielle, and then I will move to uh, Yo and John for some, some overarching closing questions that we've received. Uh, Danielle, this question comes from the Philippines, Rosabella Malo. Um, who are the players in transforming food systems? Can and are all players benefiting in this transformation? How? <laughs> Tough one to address in a, in a, in a short answer. <laughs> Um, yeah, well, that, that's, that's, that is a very tough question, um, a really important question, because increasingly, um, and I think we heard it at the outset from, uh, from Agnes Kalabata, that there's an increasing emphasis on building coalitions um, for food system transformation and making sure that these processes are much more in inclusive. Um, for a long time, we've heard that we need to be uh, responsive to demand-driven requests 
for research, but we've never kind of asked who is demanding this. Is it just national governments or is it farmers associations, civil society groups, women's groups, et cetera? Um, so I think increasingly we're seeing that the, the, the players and food system transformation are many. Um, we're getting away from just talking about um, producers versus consumers and rural versus urban. We have a much more complex group of retailers, processors, wholesalers, um, uh, consumers, et cetera. Um, so it's very complex. Um, and we need to also recognize that, that governments are also complex. Uh, ministries have different mandates and um, budgets and jealousies. Um, and so pushing a food system transformation agenda also needs to take into account that uh, in very few countries do we even have food system ministries and we're needing to, to deal with how we manage the complexity on, on the pu public sector side as well. So um, in, in response, I think we're, we're talking about, uh, we should be talking about um, as an expansive definition of the players as possible to make sure that this, this rhetoric, rhetoric about inclusion and coalitions actually becomes much more reality, particularly as we move towards the Food System Summit. Okay, thanks, thanks, Danielle. Um, Yo, in your capacity as a co-lead also of the finance lever, for the Food System Summit, there's a question here from Ramesh Deshpande, IAG International. Massive investments are needed to transform food systems. Can national budgets fund these within a reasonable time frame? If not, what are the other options? Um, it's a very good question. Actually, one of the, that's a question we're actually addressing right now in our work in preparation for the food system. Um, I think we have to look at it from, a, in a way you can classify the potential sources of finance or for financial resources of transforming food systems in, 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 in a way of six categories, if you want. Two are internal uh, categories. One is related to essentially consumer spending. I mean, that's the money going into the food value chain. The other one is uh, investments being made by all kinds of intermediaries along the value chain. And then you have external uh, funding, which comes from government spending, from capital markets, from bank lending, et cetera. And so <clears throat> to, for the transformation to be possible, we probably have to rely on reorganizing, repurposing, rethinking all these sources of funding. So I think one will not do it, but there is quite a lot of potential, I think, there. And so, again, this comes back to the overall team. I think right now people are open to think beyond the traditional constraints and see what is possible in terms of innovative financing systems to make this transformation possible. Thank you. Thank you, um, John. I think this is teeing up uh, the next uh, set of work that we have in front of us. Um, uh, Robert Richardson from Michigan State University is asking, in what ways might the COVID-19 pandemic have medium to long-term impacts on food security and food systems? Thanks, yeah. Um, well, in a lot of ways, I think. Um, one is um, COVID, I think, is, is a bit of a symptom of underlying stresses that are gonna lead us to more shocks. Uh, whether they're uh, disease, whether they're conflict, whether they're climate, whether they're financial. Um, and so we've got to be prepared for that. So the, the one thing is, and kind of why we added resilience into the equation is that um, the other kind of medium term thing goes to the kind of transformation of food systems and where they're really struggling are these transition food systems traditional short chains in rural areas are okay. The modern system is pretty adaptable. They can have shocks, but they're, they have a lot of capacity. So these transitioning systems would be been talking about the kind of evolution to informality and things like that. And so getting kind of a clear consensus on what that looks like, how we include people, et cetera, is a, is a key issue. You know, it doesn't matter what the GDP is, it's much bigger than that in terms of the benefits for people and stuff like that. I think COVID has shown us that, uh, that uh, we're all in this together. And I think maybe those are some of the underlying medium and longer term issues. Uh, thank you, John. Thanks to all of the speakers. You've really done a, a great job of outlining uh, the, the key messages coming from this report. We hope that all of you listening will pick up the report and read it um, and keep it in, in, in all of the many conversations taking place around the world on, on food systems transformation front and center. 
Um, thank you to all of you for submitting great questions. I'm sorry we couldn't get through all of them. A big, big thank you to both Agnes and Marco for helping us kick off the launch uh, of, of this report. And uh, as always, a very big thanks also to the um, IFPRI events uh, uh, management team. Um, we've, we've heard a lot about COVID. Uh, it's important uh, that, that to, to remember that COVID is not yet a crisis that we've put behind us that we will be unfortunately seeing perhaps more pandemics in the future rather than fewer. And uh, we're also anticipating a number of other uh, food system shocks coming from various sources. So again, the, 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 the viewpoints, the research, the recommendations of this report are not just timely in, in light of the COVID crisis, but also more generally when we look at food systems. Um, we will be having a number of regional events also on, on the report, and I'd like to remind you about one that's coming up um, already uh, in a couple of days, April 15th. Uh, we have a discussion for the Netherlands about the, the report. Um, so if you'd like to tune into that perhaps more European perspective on the report, we invite all of you to, to join that as well. Have a great uh, rest of your day and evening, and thank you again very much for joining us.